Good evening there, everybody, and I apologize for the late start. It's just that uh, we had some technical difficulties, and I'm now going to try and get my panel to join us. So welcome, welcome. My name is Hugo, and I am going to be your master of ceremony, so to speak, your facilitator for tonight. Um, so welcome, welcome. And tonight, I want to encourage questions about our CAPS offerings. So we are offering the South African Curriculum Virtual Schooling, and that's what tonight is about. Okay, so hopefully you guys can, um, yeah, can uh, join us and um, and ask questions and participate. I'm going to try and invite the panelists. I may have to ring off and um, and start again if I can't join them whilst we are already in discussions. But let's see. Okay. Um, I'm just looking up there. Yes, there we go. I can invite them. So that's exciting. Okay. Um, so Cambry Learn has been renowned as you know, for Cambridge International Virtual Schooling, okay? But we decided to actually start offering the CAPS National Curriculum. Now that's shocked a lot of people. So tonight we're gonna to try and explain our reasoning and why we did that. So please don't be surprised uh, by the topics that will be covered. We welcome all of them, of course, and you're welcome to also submit any doubts that you have uh, about, um, you know, the differences between the curriculums. As parents, I know you may be worried as to how do you actually select which is the most appropriate curriculum, so how do you blend them? Because you can, you actually can, hey? So that's what's exciting. Okay, so here we go. I have uh, invited our panelists to join us again. Uh, let's see if uh, that was successful. There we go. It looks like it was. Okay, so the National Curriculum of South Africa is called CAPS, okay? It's the National Curriculum, but it's set out in a way that's termed CAPS. We can find out from our pedagogues what that means. Um, and it's actually less um, about curriculum changes. There we go. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure. There we go, Brett. Now we're all on the same page. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> I was just explaining to the audience that uh, we had some technical difficulties, but never mind, never mind. And we've already got our first question. I just said to them as a warm up that we were going to discuss how a parent would choose the most appropriate curriculum or possibly even blend them. Was that a possibility? And then I did anticipate the question from our parents. Why is Cambridge Learn offering the South African National Curriculum? Because we've been synonymous with Cambridge International, right? So I think that's uppermost in many people's minds. Why? Why are we doing this? So uh, I do want to cover that. But I do want to give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves because uh, some of our audience will know you well, but some of us may not know you that well. So um, I think we're just going to go in no particular order, starting with Cecilia. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your role in Cambridge Learn, please, Cecilia? Sure, sure. Um, so I am um, uh, the principal of, of Cambridge Learn. Um, I've been involved in um, the business since day one. And um, I've been involved in every aspect of the business, from sales to content development to teaching. And the business has just grown so much that I'm now solely focused um, on being the principal. So, um, yeah, that's a very brief overview. Thank you. Belinda, tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself. And so I'm Hi. the HO. Hello, Hugo. So lovely to Hello. see you. Uh, I'm the you. HOD of the primary school. Um, so currently looking after the stage one to six in the Cambridge curriculum and involved in the CAPS project as well with content development and overseeing all um, grades one to, to nine. I was going to say one to seven, one to nine. And it's exciting and it's fast moving and it, it's a good thing to be a part of. So, yes, thank you. Welcome, welcome. Great. Uh, hello, Hugo, Hi. Cecilia. Hi there, how are you? And Good everyone watching this evening. Thank you, Hugo, I'm well. Um, I, sorry, as you were sharing with the, the audience this evening about uh, the panelists joining the, the Zoom session, I was reminded of my first day of university sitting in one of those massive lecture halls where the introduction from the, the lecturer was always, this is X lecture. If you're in the wrong place, please leave now. Uh, <laughs> Which, which was a godsend in my first three or four weeks of university because I think I left every single lecture at least once. Um, my name is Brett Garner. I'm the deputy principal of Cambry Learn. 
Uh, what does that mean? It means that I get to interact with pretty much everything that the business throws at me and more, and I'm loving it. This is, as Belinda has already suggested, a fantastically fast moving environment, which is quite contrary to what many of us seasoned educators have experienced in education. It's often a comment that we make that, you know, school just doesn't, it's just not dynamic enough. Whereas an online education environment like Cambry Learn, where the CAPS or the British curriculum is unbelievably dynamic. And it's why all of us look as though we're not a day over 20 because we feel as though we're back in our youth. Uh, we need all the, the energy pulls and energy drinks we can muster because um, every day is an exciting, exciting dynamic. Um, you can't prepare for this day kind of day. I think that's a good description of uh, some of the passion that uh, pervades uh, Cambry Learn and Top Dog, I think I would agree with you there. We're very privileged to be able to serve uh, the, uh, the learning community out there across the globe. But tonight we focus specifically on the South African option of curriculum eh, that we're offering in comparison to our international one. I think South Africans are most welcome and often do take the international uh, British curriculum that we offer. But uh, let's kick off by looking at that. Why did we add? the South African national curriculum to our bouquet of, uh, of virtual schooling options. Um, yeah, I don't know who wants to take that. Cecilia, everyone's the founder of Cambry yeah. Learn. Why, why not? You, why, did you <laughs> why did you venture into CAPS? So CAPS, I think um, there's a market for it. Our clients have asked for CAPS. So if our clients ask for something and they persistently ask for something, we're going to give them what they want. And that is the short and the straight of it. And what I said before, so I think a lot of what I'm going to be, sa uh, be saying, and I think a lot of what a lot, all of us are going to be saying is going to be repetition of what we said last time. We want to take caps and remember our slogan from last time, and we want to make it great. We really do. Mm -hmm. So we want to take a curriculum that has been criticized and uh, laughed at. And um, I mean, everybody knows all the stories about caps. And we want to present a high quality product mm. that is going to teach kids um, the skills that they need to succeed at varsity, to succeed in life as well. Mm. And we want these kids, we don't just want our Cambridge students to be fully prepared for varsity because that, that, was, that was why I fell in love with Cambridge because I know that the dropout rate for students who do the, the British curriculum is lower than the CAPS curriculum. And it's not the curriculum's fault. Mm. It's the way the curriculum is delivered. And we want to change that. Mm. And what we also want to do, I mean, th this comes from, and I'm sure a lot of parents uh, 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 can talk to me about this. And I know Belinda being a principal of a, of a CAPS school um, and me having friends who've got kids who are at primary school um, doing the CAPS curriculum. These poor kids are so overburdened with so, so many projects and so many tasks that the poor kids aren't even living a life. That's what I loved about Cambridge was that a lot of Cambridge schools get away with offering math, English, science. They focus on the core subjects and the kids can be kids. So we also want to take caps and adapt it slightly so that these kids can just have a more balanced approach to life. We don't want to give you guys projects that the parents have to do. We want to give you work that the kids are actually going to do and, and high quality teachers and I think we all know that there's a problem in South Africa with the quality of teachers and our great teachers are leaving and the great thing is we've just lost three teachers that are immigrating but they're staying on because we're a virtual school so we're not losing the great teachers we we're actually employing international teachers so we're still able to give you the best teachers Thanks, Cecilia. Belinda, you were mentioned there, so I'm going to segue right to you there, because you actually were a principal of, you know, a traditional South African school, bricks and mortar, before you joined us. So what would you say are, are the benefits of offering CAPS? Well, look, I came from a schooling environment, too, that um, we, we had the flexibility to adjust CAPS to suit the needs of our learners, because we were a school for children who learned differently. Um, and I'm saying that, that they were kids that didn't find their niche in a normal, typical mainstream school. Um, and that's the beauty of CAPS, is that you can adjust it to suit the needs of your learner. And if we take what we do well on the Cambridge mm -hmm. Learn platform at the moment with Cambridge, 
and why does it suit our learners? Why, you know, why, why are our students flourishing in the primary school? on the Cambridge system, it's because they have the flexibility, because they don't have the pressures of being in a 30 to 40 student mm. um, class, that they can go at their own pace. Mm. Um, and that's what we're going to try and mirror in the CAPS curriculum, where we take away those added pressures of having a CAPS curriculum in a normal mainstream school, where it's uh, everything's done by a tick box schedule that they have to get so many assessments done by a certain time, and it creates an anxiety and pressure amongst the students. Um, and I think that's where children, a lot of children, they, they fall out of love with learning and in education and, and school. Um, and, and they start not enjoying learning. And that's mm -hmm. sad because life is a, is, is a learning journey. It doesn't stop when you finish school. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to instill in the children, this, this continuing lifelong understanding that you know it, learning's about enjoyment it's about having fun it's about looking at the world around you um and, and that doesn't stop and i think that's what you know a lot of people turn away from caps because they're subjected to that in a, in a mainstream environment thanks belinda i'm gonna i'm gonna bring in brett here to answer <laughs> the same question if you have anything to add brett i'm sure you will but I've also got to add a little coda to that question. What about the perception that CAPS is inferior mm. to Cambridge? I mean, it's, mm. it's a, it's a well-known perception. And also this idea that we focused and specialized on the Cambridge International, the British International Curriculum. Are we overstretching ourselves? One of mm. our audience members asked us that. So are we really mm. able to offer a completely different curriculum? Mm. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, just to that question, it's a, it's a very important question from a business perspective, so I will definitely want to answer that. But just to go back to CAPS, you know, Cecilia has alluded to the fact that it's a great curriculum. The South African National Curriculum is, is, in my personal opinion, a very good curriculum. I've been in SA education for 25 odd years, and I think that the, the, the national curriculum statement, let's call it CAPS for the moment, uh, is particularly good. The, the problem and Belinda's alluded to this, is that the expression of that curriculum, that process of education in a typical school, which has multiple pressures on it. There are so many things that schools have to do over and above educating children that it's no wonder that they battle to do just that. The truth is the expression of the curriculum that most, most students and parents experience is not great. And so I'll, I'll use maths as an example. My son is following the CAPS curriculum uh, and he's doing particularly well in maths. In fact, I'd suggest that he's much further ahead of in maths than I was at his age and I'm pretty good at maths. That's my teaching subject. Um, it, it's not a bad curriculum. He happens to have a very good teacher. He happens to be really engaged in his classwork. He happens to really love the subject and he's passionate about it. And that's the, the sum total. The result is that his experience of CAPS has been very good. And so he's producing the results. Many students haven't had that opportunity. Cambridge Learn will give every student a chance to experience CAPS the way it's meant to be experienced. Quality education, small classes and individual attention and the ability for us to hone in on issues that need to be resolved, focus areas, extension work, whatever the case is, right from the start, not in the fourth term, two weeks before your report is issued. Oh, hello, Mr. Garner, by the way, uh, we need to have a meeting, something's wrong. Belinda, am I right? That's the typical approach in the bricks and mortar school, partly because there are so many check boxes that need to be checked. Um, in terms of Cambridge Learn, the British curriculum focused company that's done really, really well. And it is a very good platform with a very good product. Aren't we, aren't we in danger of shooting ourselves in the foot by taking on caps? No, not at all. And Cecilia will, will share this, I'm sure, if we ask her directly, but we, we're not taking all the Cambridge Learn traditional British curriculum teachers and asking them to double their workload and teach British curriculum and CAPS. We have a completely separate team. What we have with the Cambridge Learn platform is an unbelievably robust, tried and tested platform. You know, we didn't wake up in the pandemic and say, let's quickly create a product that's going to allow distance education uh, learners or homeschoolers to, to not have to go to school. We've been doing this for, for way longer than the pandemic has been a thought. So we have a tried and tested, tested platform and a massive demand for an alternative service provider in the CAPS curriculum space. We believe we can be that service provider because 
The platform is tried and tested. Our teachers are very experienced. Belinda has a huge amount of experience. I've got lots of experience. We all are intimately involved with the CAPS curriculum in some way or another. And so it's not difficult for us to simply broaden our horizons. We've not branched into a whole new direction. We've simply added and opened our focus a little bit. Will the Cambridge curriculum or the British International curriculum suffer? Absolutely not. In fact, there are new things we're gonna be trying because CAPS asks us to do that, that we can then bring back into the Cambridge Learn platform. Mm. Will CAPS suffer because we've got an international focus? Well, no ways, because that international focus is one of the things that our students are definitely gonna pick up. It's a South African curriculum, but we're looking far further than simply a South African university or a South African future. We have to, this is a global village and we're playing in a very, very big and important global space. Thanks, Brett. Um, I actually hadn't thought about uh, yeah, the one complementing, but also enhancing the other. You know, what we learn from one, we can bring to the other because they both have strengths. You're quite right. It's not like you can categorically say one curriculum is always superior to another. I think you've got to fit the curriculum to the child and also for the purpose. You know, and yes, one might be more globally relevant, but then you can bring a lot of that international viewpoint to a national curriculum. I hadn't thought of that. So, well, there we go. I'm learning, guys. Uh, I've got a tough question for you, Belinda. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's a fair question to pose to you, but here's the story. So one of our parents' his daughter started at primary stage one last year, having done uh, a grade one or being of grade one equivalent age in the South African school system. She's passed and she's now gone on to primary stage two. But this mom said she found the transition from the CAPS grade one to primary stage one quite tough and that her daughter had seemed to have lost a year or a bit of schooling because she had not been on the British curriculum. How would you advise that one bridge this gap? So she's passed primary stage one Cambridge and in yeah. primary stage two. But she found there was a gap. In yes, doing from that, that transitioning from grade one. To primary yes. stage one. Yeah. Yes, because I would think the grade one is more phonics based um, and number recognition, which is probably more in line with the read to write program. Um, lots, lots of reading. So, you know, we only do the three subjects in primary Cambridge, the, the English, maths and science. And I think, you know, to bridge that gap at home, expose your child to a lot of reading texts. Look with your child and read with them enrich their vocabulary, do a lot of number recognition with them to try and bridge those gaps. Um, but in those, in those junior primary school years, it's exposing them to, the, to a lot of texts for English um, and enriching their conversational vocab too. You know, I see it a lot with the children that are on our Cambridge platform as they're very, very good orally speaking, engaging with you in conversation and the Q&As, but come to writing too is, is, is a problem. You know, expressing their thoughts and unpacking their thinking in their written assignments and tests, they, short, they fall short. Um, and, you know, whether that's a sign of the times with all children in the school, possibly, yes, because I saw it in mainstream school as well. Um, and, and maybe they're not practicing their written tasks as much, but I think as parents, you, you know, you're the first and foremost teachers on a homeschooling program. We're the backup crew. Um, and, and I think, you know, getting your child to, to write stories, creative stories, do illustrations with them at that age, um, because you don't want to, to, to overburden them. You want them to enjoy what they're doing and love learning. Um, so getting them to do things like creative things like making their books, writing stories, reading with them and spending time with them and not just storybooks, poetry, nursery rhymes. Um, it can only help. Thank you very much. Uh, I know Brett's quite eager to answer Jeffrey's question about contrasting and comparing the two curriculums. So over to you, Brett. Thank you, Hugo. It, it actually, it's, it's because I realized you asked me another question, which I didn't answer because I'm so verbose and I do apologize. Um, you asked me about the, the comment that, that CAPS is possibly not as difficult as the British curriculum or vice versa. And it speaks mm -hmm. to what Belinda's just 
addressed now. And the truth is, you know, the, the, the British curriculum is, is quite focused. It's known for being very academic, where other curriculums like, you know, possibly the common core is, is a little bit more uh, experiential or there's, there's a lot more diversity. I think something like the intellect, international baccalaureate versus A-levels, for example. Um, the, the reality is they're all quite challenging. They all have their own challenge. They all have their own academic merit. And in South Africa, we, we regard a CAPS matric, for example, as the equivalent of British curriculum AS level. They're, they're of equal academic weight. But the truth is the way that we engage with the material can seem and feel to be quite different. And it's true at primary stage one level. You know, in South Africa, we, we start, I think, relatively slowly, and we then catch up over time. Whereas the British curriculum starts uh, uh, at pace. And it's got to do with the fact that in South Africa, it takes our, our early uh, learners, our, our ECD children, uh, early childhood development uh, uh, center children, a, a while to ramp up into the academics because their exposure to academic input is limited. You know, it's, it's a function of the nature of our countries. The truth is, if you were to compare us to New Zealand, for example, if I took a typical grade four in New Zealand, in fact, Belinda, you can speak about this because you've got experience. But if I took a grade four from New Zealand versus a grade four from South Africa, I'll tell you, we're in trouble. Because it feels as though that New Zealand kid is way ahead. Mm -hmm. But then contrast the two 16-year-olds, and you're beginning to see some really good stuff coming out of the South African child. Mm -hmm. A CAPS child, not necessarily the British curriculum child. So let's just quickly compare uh, British curriculum with, with CAPS. The, the primary difference is that there is a strong focus in the British curriculum, certainly in the way that we do it, um, in terms of looking at the core of the curriculum or the core curriculum, English, maths, and science. And you know, many people find it quite uh, unsettling that a student can get all the way to 13 or 14 only ever having done English, maths and science. And then suddenly you throw social science, history, geography at them, or you throw physics at them or something you know, uh, really out there. Um, statistics, anyone who does maths will know statistics are terrible. Um, and yet those children who've had that very narrow focus seem to be able to cope. Why is that? Well, it's because you've focused on the learning and the ability and the nature of learning. Mm. You've given the, the, the student a skill set that they can then translate. With CAPS, we do it quite differently. With CAPS, we say, let's give a very broad overview of as many things as we can. We touch on all the important things, history, geography, biology, English, uh, is it causa, whatever it is. And the idea is that with enough exposure, students will be able to see where they gravitate to naturally. And I think that's a wise way of doing things. It's not the only way of doing things, but it does work for some students. And also we can then begin to say, hang on, here's a child who has a, I, I, I'm, I'm at pains to say a natural affinity for maths because um, I don't Nobody think has a natural having, affinity to maths, I don't think, <laughs> except you, Brett. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone has a natural affinity for academics. But the point is, <laughs> students tend to gravitate and find their niche and then begin to focus on that. So that by the time they get to the end of grade nine or grade 10, and they're making important life decisions, they actually have a little bit of something to go on. You know, we saw that on the Cambridge Learn platform when we wanted students to start choosing things like business or accounting or economics. For the first time, a student on a core curriculum is saying, I have no idea what economics is about. Why would I choose it? So Cecilia said, let's give these students some exposure to this material, created an EMS course, and most CAPS parents know about EMS. And these students then had a chance to look at accounting, business studies, economics, and then were able to make a, a lifelong a decision that would impact them on a lifelong journey. And, and let me just business. jump in here. Let mm. me tell you that Please. these kids who are doing accounting and business and economics, they've never done it before many of mm. them. Mm. And they can get their distinctions. Let me tell you, and I think speaking from a high school perspective, kids coming from grade nine, from CAPS, do not struggle. They can go to IGCSE. They don't struggle. If, if they maybe find, you know, they can't do everything in one year, then they do it in 18 months. That's the flexibility of Cambridge. But the problem where most kids struggle with Cambridge, and I think everybody knows what I'm going to say, is when you jump from IG to AS. And that we have realized is actually a fault in the curriculum. In my opinion, there should be a bridging phase between IG and AS. And this is something that we've definitely got in our project plan. 
because we find that kids can get their distinctions at IG. Do you know that statistics, and this I've got, we've attended Cambridge conferences around the world. They have told us that the average student drops two symbols when they move from IG to AES, two symbols. So, so where's the problem? And, and I mean, uh, Jeepers, I, I, I'm the biggest fan of Cambridge, but it, it's just telling me that, um, I'm just telling the parents here that caps up to grade nine, you, you can join IG, your kid's going to be fine. We just want to look at a way that we can make it better for the kids to move from IG to AS. Mm. Because that AS year, it's a tough year. It, it mm. really is a tough year. And I think that it's, I mean, that's why a lot of the stuff that the learners do at AS are like, first year varsity and I think that's why they are so well prepared for first year varsity because they get the shock of their lives when they get to AS level mm. but we really want to reduce that and like I said it's, it's in our project one of the many things that that we really do want to look at doing especially mm. for the subject subjects where there is a high a failure rate across the board something mm. like English for example I've been involved mm. in Cambridge schools and let me tell you those mm. Cambridge schools get their results at the end of the year and um, those AES kids, um, it's a shock for a lot of them. So, um, yeah. And yeah. sorry, another thing just to mention, uh, Brett, about the difference between CAPS and Cambridge at senior levels as well is, of mm. course, the fact that with Cambridge, you write one exam. That's mm. your only chance. You go through the whole year. If you stuff up that exam at the end of the year, sorry for you. Fortunately, you can rewrite it six months later. That's the flexibility of Cambridge. Whereas at least with CAPS, you've got your continuous assessments. So you are accumulating marks that are mm. going to count toward your final mark, mm. which does mm. make it much, which does make it easier. Mm. Okay, so on that note, I don't know who wants to address this, but uh, Tush has asked here, how do exams and the, you know, the, the, the year work, the PATS as they know, maybe you wanna just, uh, you know, unpack that word, Brett, for us, the PATS. Uh, and then do learners have to register with the Department of Education, for example, for that year work? Have we lost Brett? Oh, no, sorry, I, I did. I lost you at the very end there. Um, okay. Just to go, look, the, the registration question is, uh, it's a can of worms, Hugo, because it depends on the fence on which you sit. It depends. It's not even about the side of the fence that you're looking at. It's the one that you're sitting on. Um, in South Africa, the majority of homeschooled students don't register with the departments um, because of the conflict between the Constitution and the SA Schools Act. One says you have freedom, the other one says if you're going to, no, not, not if, when you do this, you need to tick a number of boxes. So they're in conflict. If you do register, then you need to be sure that you are prepared to abide by what you've said when you've ticked the various boxes in the registration document, which is, I will follow an essentially a national curriculum. I will keep track of a number of assessments. I will write certain exams at certain periods. Whereas if you were, strictly speaking, a homeschooler or an unschooler, you, you wouldn't be subjecting yourself, yourself to those sorts of rules. So um, do I have to register? The law says yes. The constitution says no. If you want to know what I would do, um, we, we could take it offline. <laughs> Well, but you know what I like to do? I like to leave the legal to the experts, which is the Pestalozzi Trust, and the Legal Defense Society of South Africa, Correct. and they themselves say, don't. Yeah. They say, they estimate, because it is just an estimate, that only 2%, 2% of homeschoolers actually comply with mm. the regulation to register the department. But we mm. leave it up to the parents, you know, we don't require it, it's the parent's own choice. Am I right? Mm. I think it's a personal Correct. choice. Yeah. Correct. But, Correct. Yeah. All, all yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I will encourage a parent, if you do register, and obviously there is a, there is an SA Schools Act which calls for the registration, and there are departments of education in provinces that, that expect it. If you do register, please read everything that you, that you put your name to very, very carefully. It is quite onerous, and it makes me nervous as someone who is seasoned in the South African education sector. Mm -hmm. Pats, uh, help me, Belinda. That's an older term, isn't it? It's not a current. Yeah, we, we, no. we talk about school-based assessments at the moment, and I, and I recall Pats SBA. from my. Pats are an old. I think when we were at school, when we were lessons, yeah, it was just a long I think time ago. Those are our practical assessment tasks from our 
outcomes yes. based education and curriculum 21 days which by the way i still rate very highly and uh, the the caps was a refinement of that particular approach to education so it's again why i'm not a i'm not a detractor from caps i think it's a very good approach to education um Hugo, I sort of go back to Jeffrey's question about comparing grade ones, uh, yeah. the Cambridge curriculum versus um, CAPS. The, the, the other big difference is that CAPS is a national, it's an expression of a national curriculum and a nation, a country, a state has its own agenda when it comes to education. Uh, South Africa is not trying to simply make clever academics or accomplished mathematicians or students who are ready for the fourth industrial re revolution. They're also trying to instill in students a particular value for human uh, similarity. Our country has a, has, has a history of pointing out the differences, uh, possibly understanding history and separation, possibly looking at things like understanding the value of your fellow human. So things like life orientation or life skills in the earliest stages, th those are very important in the CAPS curriculum. Mm. It's part of the curriculum. Every single stage has that just like it has medium of instruction, in mm -hmm. our case, English, or it has maths. Uh, you know, they, they all have massive value. They might not have academic merit. And hear me carefully, when you get to university, your life orientation mark is probably not worth much, if anything at all. But it doesn't mean that the subject is not important. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things about education that certainly something like Cambry Learn has taught me in the very relatively short time that I've been here is that there is massive value in being educated. It's not necessarily all academic. So some of the one of the things that stu students on our platform, whether they cap students or British curriculum students experience is the, the need to work independently. Now that is a skill that you don't <laughs> measure with the mark. You don't say Johnny got an A for being an independent learner. But I'll tell you this much, the students on our platform who perform, they're independent learners. Mm. They don't need mom to check the homework. They don't need dad to say, what are you doing tomorrow? They don't need granny to walk into the classroom in the morning or the, you know, the homeschool office or whatever it is and say, where are your books? I sent Cecilia a, a, a picture this morning or this afternoon, Cecilia, of a student who's busy doing artificial intelligence, one of the courses that we offer. Do you know, in, in a mainstream environment, that student was regarded as being particularly academically weak. He, he could never complete a task. He could, in fact, he couldn't get through a lesson without being thrown out of the classroom. By four o'clock this afternoon, the mom was pulling her hair out because he wouldn't stop working. Hello? He is so excited about learning that they have to put measures in place to stop him from working above a certain number of hours per day. Now, that child deserves an A in my book for effort, for excitement, for commitment. That, that's, that's not a difference between CAPS necessarily and the British curriculum, but it is a difference between what we will offer and what we do offer in a homeschooling environment mm. or a distance education environment Absolutely. versus the, the, the regulated environment of a bricks and mortar classroom. So and, I just want to encourage then, Jeffrey, yeah. that there are differences in the curriculums, mm. but the major difference you'll experience is in how we teach and how your child experiences learning, whichever curriculum you choose. And I can see, I think it's Liesl who's got a question about the, the which, which one do you choose? The, yeah, in the, the truth is, the, yeah. the, the truth is, you can't go wrong if you go with Cambridge Learn. And now I'm going to stop. I just and want just to jump in there with, with I'm sorry, Belinda, go for okay. it. I'll jump no, in no, I just want to pick up what, what Brett was saying then about the choice, you know. I um, mean, I know from, from my own children is, is that being my son being in a smaller school, they do CAPS it's in a SASA school, but because it's a smaller school, they don't get the options of having all the rich curriculum that CAPS has to offer. They have to choose. And when they come to grade 10 and they've got to choose their subjects, well, they can't take all the subjects that they want to take because it clashes on the timetable. So on an online program, you you don't have that issue, you know, and, and the kids that want to do CAT have to go off to another school to do CAT. Um, so there's, the, you know, the beauty of that flexibility of being able to have the choice of the subjects that you want to do and not having to be told no to um, because these timetable clashes, or there's not a teacher to teach that subject, um, which often happens with the CAPS curriculum um, to, to students when they get to grade 10, they can't do their favourite subject. So, 
I know I knew this was going to come up. Okay, we haven't even got to merging the curricula, you know, or blending them, you know, using subjects from both. But here's a question: What about transitioning from one to the other? So Johan here has said, if a student's on the Cambridge International Syllabus right now and they want to switch to CAPS, say they had lower secondary phase, so you know, grade eight, nine, or they're already in the IGCSE phase of Cambridge, is it possible at that stage to change to the CAPS curriculum? At IG, it's possible. Grade nine, it's quite possible. That's not a problem. I'll tell you where the problem's going to come when they want to go from grade. 10 or grade 11 into AS because then we're going to say to them sorry you've got to do IGCSE first because I can tell you now if you want to do certain subjects and I'm speaking about my subjects like AS accounting you are not going to cope if you have done grade 10 at a government school and I've actually had some parents get you, you know get a bit angry we're not doing this to spike the child we're doing it because we've got experience and we know the child is going to struggle so the best place is prior, I mean, to me, the best place is grade nine. Let them go into IG. Let them get used to the terminology, the international terminology, the way things work, because there are, there are little um, um, nuances that are so, so different. I mean, we use dollars. South Africa, they use rands. It takes a while to get used to that sort of thing. So I would recommend grade nine is probably the latest stage where you should shift them over. Um, not later than that. Mm. Okay. So it hasn't been asked, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Well, actually, sorry, it has been asked. There we go. Will, will I be able to buy only some CAP subjects? You know, because obviously the South African curriculum is more rigid in its subject prescription. You know, it's not a subject by subject system in, by nature, unlike Cambridge, where it's quite possible to just buy one subject at a time or only study a certain number of subjects over a period of time. It's a lot more flexible in that sense. So mm. someone's just asked, can I buy just some of the CAP subjects? And I'm going to add to that, can I add CAP subjects to Cambridge subjects? How does that work? Oh, pick me, pick me. You go, maybe I can just follow on from Cecilia's answer because it speaks to this particular issue. And, and I know I've used this before in other webinars and in other conversations and I'm sure somebody watching tonight has heard me answer it in this way before, but my question is going to be why? Why do you want to mix? Why do you want to mix two different curriculums? Why do you want CAPS and Cambridge together or CAPS and British curriculum together? If your answer is I want enrichment, I want to, I want to learn more, I want to grow more, I want to be academically stimulated, you know, then go for it. If it's because you want university entrance or you want a matric exemption or you want to go and study at Oxford or Harvard or whatever it is, then beware. Because mixed curriculums don't do anyone any favors because when you get to wherever you're going, they will look at the mixed bag and the first question they will have is, why is it mixed? Why didn't you just focus on one? And the second is, they'll say to you, I'm sorry, I have to choose one, which is, which is the one you want me to choose? So for example, if a, if a student is doing IG biology and they want to then do grade 11 geography, uh, one of those is going to be for enrichment. You can't offer those both to the university and say, please look, I've done biology and geography. Um, in terms of the can you, it, it practically, can I take a handful of CAP subjects like English and maths and not the others? Yes, of course you can. Uh, the Cambridge Learn platform is very robust. Students are able to buy pretty much whatever they want to. Well, whatever their parents are prepared to pay for. It sounds like my son buying IT equipment. Um, but the, the, the question you need to ask is, where's the value? One of the questions was, should I buy the whole grade? Will Cambridge Learn force me to buy everything for grade nine? Or can I just choose the things I want? Do you know, we will strongly encourage you to buy grade nine. If you're doing the CAPS curriculum, buy the grade nine subjects, for goodness sakes, so that by the end of the year, you've got a grade nine behind you. The way the South African curriculum works is it's grade based. You won't get through, you won't pass the grade if you don't have maths. And certainly when you get to the point where you're in grade 10, 11, and 12, and that falls outside of the, the sort of the formal schooling or the, the mandatory schooling uh, uh, sector in South Africa, you know, once you're in grade 10, 11, and 12, FET phase, it's a different set of rules that apply. So Cambridge Learn will offer FET, grade 10, 11, and 12, will be accredited by Sakai. Our students will write the NSC, the National Senior Certificate. They'll get a Sakai certificate that says they've got a matric certificate. And if they've done well enough and their combinations are correct, they'll get a matric exemption, which means they go to university 
and the university says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's very important because it's at that point where I need to go back to anyone who's looking at the British curriculum and say, when you stand in front of a university with an A for matric maths, and you stand in front of a university with an A with AS maths, they have equal academic merit. But I'll tell you which one is harder to get an A for, and that's the British curriculum. Because the way we examine in the British curriculum is different from the way we examine in CAPS. It's fundamentally different. So just sorry, Brett, I just want to jump in there because I just want to <clears throat> I just want to add in a, a very important point. So I was involved in a pre-university college. And I'll tell you what I have seen a number of times in South Africa. If you get a CAPS matric and you, you get your CAPS exemption and you apply to varsity, they often turn around and say, no, you haven't met the requirement for this course. Go and do an A-level. So mm. in that case, you can certainly mm. supplement your existing mm. matric certificate. That's why we have these pre-university courses. So in that case, that's the beauty of Cambridge. We've had so many students come to Cambridge Learn who have said to us, I've got my matric, but I want to study veterinary science and I don't have physics. And then the varsities will say, go and do your A-level. So that's mm. also the beauty of Cambridge, where you're mm. able to supplement and do your A-level when you're 24, 25. We had a, a, a student with Cambridge Learn, I think she was about 20, about 24 years old, it was an international student, and she needed to do the, the, the sciences because she wanted to be a vet. So she had her, 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 her matric exemption, and, and she, she was based in another country, and then she supplemented it with an A-level. So in that case, you can do it, but you're not going to get a single certificate that gives you a qualification that consists of three CAP subjects and three Cambridge subjects. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. And so I mean, point it's like that too. Yeah, Belinda. Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, I've had an instance like that too. So a student who finished with maths literacy on CAPS, BCom law was not open to him because he didn't meet the requirements and they allowed him to take AS maths, but he had to get at least a C yeah. and then they'd accept him into BCom mm. law. But that's, as you say, it's a top up. So you'll have qualified with the school leaving certificate through Correct. CAPS and Your then he's exemption. adding to that. Yeah, you've got exactly. emerging certificates. You're quite right. You can't, Correct. by South African law, present a mix of CAPS and Cambridge. N neither internationally, because there's no such yeah. thing. Except, yeah. except you can merge different British curricula. So when yeah. we start offering Edexcel, Edexcel. in the future, mm. then you can merge your a, a level from Edexcel and your A level from Cambridge, and that will give you a certificate. Mm. But that's yeah. another day. That's a whole other conversation. Whole day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did you want have, to uh, pose, yeah, Brett. Something sorry, may, may I answer the, the question about the bricks and mortar school versus online school? Because it yes, actually went through my true. mind as I was talking, and I hope there would be an opportunity to do that. Uh, and I'll, I'll segue into that answer just by closing off and saying that the, the one thing I do want to, to point out to parents today in the world that we live in today, when I was growing up, my mom gave me to school and the school did everything. And all that she had to do was worry about paying 120 Rand per annum school fees. By the way, that's that's what my school charged school fees. It went from zero to 120 Rand, 10 Rand a month for 12 months. And my mom almost died. Uh, it, it might point to the fact that I'm uh, possibly a little bit long in the tooth. Um, but the point is, parents today really need to be involved in the education process in terms of where will this education take my child? Because simply having a matric or a matric exemption uh, or three A-level subjects is is good, but it might not be good enough. We live in a very small world where so many people are looking to the same position that our own children are, are looking to. And, and we need to be sure that when we get there, when they're 20 or 19 or whenever, that, that we don't look back and say, sure, but we missed something. We should have done something differently. Onto this issue of why are my children? Or, mm. Yeah, look, I've got three children. One is not eligible for school. She's a newborn. <laughs> one is about to start grade R and one is about to start grade eight. And my grade eight son is in a bricks and mortar school. Why is that? Um, it's not his choice. If it was up to him, he would be doing IGCSEs the year after next. And he's <laughs> academically capable. He wants to finish foundation two on the Cambrian platform by the end of next year. That's his desire. 
But my particular setup in terms of my child's development, and remember, this is not the academic development of my child. My child's particular development um, right now for where he is as a growing teenager needs the, um, the, the rounding effect of other human beings in a classroom environment so that his rough edges are worked mm -hmm. away slowly so that when he fits into uh, the society in which I think he'll find himself, he'll fit in comfortably for the other members of the society. Shame, uh, if he was here, he'd be hitting me with a stick, which is part <laughs> of why I need him to go to school. Um, the, yeah. the truth is, education, I believe, we look for the, 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 the setup that suits the child. Yeah. And there is no panacea. There's mm -hmm. no silver bullet. Cambridge Learn is not going to suit every child, guaranteed. Neither mm -hmm. is that very good and expensive Isasa school. Neither is that old um, ivy covered state or X model C school. Neither is, you know, the, the, the latest and the greatest, the one that's got all the money that's flighting all the ads on TV saying we are the best. You know what? They're not going to work for all, not that no one school can work for all students. I know from my own child's experience over the last 13 years that being in a class with 28 other little boys is very, very important right now to his mm -hmm. development. What I will say is that when he gets to 16, I'm going to be hard pressed to keep him away from an online platform like Cambridge Learn, because there's a very good chance he'll be academically ahead of his peer group and that school will be holding him back academically. Hopefully by then he'll have yeah, he'll have gotten to the point he needs to be uh, uh, emotionally and, and socially. My daughter, on the other hand, she is a social butterfly. If mm -hmm. she wasn't in a classroom, if she was in front, or well, she was with me the whole day doing homeschooling, I think I would break her spirit. Mm -hmm. She's not terribly academically focused. She doesn't really want to do well mathema with mathematics or English or Afrikaans or whatever. She wants to play with her friends the whole day. So am I going to rob her of that? Absolutely not. Because by the time she's 16, I'll pull her out of school and put her in Cambridge or Cambridge Learn rather. And she'll get her caps, her common core, her British curriculum and whatever else it is that we're offering by then, hey, Cecilia, mm. because I know this much, we won't simply be doing caps and the 100%. British curriculum by the time she is 16. So Hugo, or, or to Anonymous, the, the, the beauty of education today is that we don't have a one size fits all and nobody expects you to do a one size fits all. Mm. Does it mean that Belinda or I are not able to work in an online environment or offer the best? No, absolutely not. We understand the constraints of the education system for different but, students. Yeah. And we're and privileged out. to be in an environment where we can give something different to those students who aren't going to be in the Sorry, I'm just aware that there, there are quite a few questions coming mm. through. So I just want to make sure we can answer as many of these. Mm. Somebody mm. has just asked here about, and it is here that we are interested to add a second language on CAPS. Is it advisable in primary stage two to add a second language? Absolutely. I would, without a doubt, add a second language. And um, Add Afrikaans, that's all we're offering right now, but absolutely yeah. that would be enriching it. Without a doubt, that is one of the flaws, 100% of Cambridge, because remember, at IG and AS level, they have to have a second language in order to get their matrix equivalent. So they have to have a second language. And Afrikaans, by the way, a very, a very interesting fact, a lot of our Zulu students, and I'm talking about when I was involved in traditional schools, they rather did Afrikaans than Isi Zulu because the Afrikaans is easier. Yeah. So that's why the, the, the first language Zulu speakers rather did Afrikaans. So yes, absolutely, 100% um, um, add that for sure. If that answers that question. I saw there were a couple of others, Hugo. Yeah, oh, I think uh, the other well, one. Here's, else. here's one Would question you... that uh, is quite tricky. So I don't know who the panel wants to answer. It's about fleshing out how we're gonna deliver CAPS. How the CAPS classes to be structured? Will it be offered okay. in a fixed time slot like a traditional school timetable? Will it be more flexible like on our Cambridge offering? Okay, so, so let me jump in here as well. CAPS, and this is something very important. If you're trying to decide whether it's going to be the British or the, 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 the CAPS curriculum, our CAPS program is a lot more structured. So the nice thing about that, I mean, the beauty of our British curriculum is that it's so flexible, but of course that's got its downfalls because there's very little, I don't know if camaraderie is the right word, but where students are all working together and they're all doing the same project together and they can talk about their work 
we lack that because of the flexibility we offer. With CAPS, it's going to be structured. So all the kids are starting on the 17th of January. They've got a fixed timetable. They can move ahead, but they, they are going to be limited because there's certain projects that might have a two-week time span. For example, I, this is the example I always use. They've got to grow a plant. It's going to take them two weeks for that plant, that specific seed to grow. So it is going to be more structured, but the beauty of that is that the, 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 the live lessons are going to be consist of students that are all on the same pace. All the kids are more or less going to be doing the same assignments, the same lessons. There is the option to go the completely independent route. And that is if you go with our starter package. So that is where the parents, we give you the memo, we give you everything. It's like giving you school in a box and we kind of say to you, there we go, you go and deliver it then you can definitely have the absolute flex uh, the, the flexibility so it would depend the pack on the package that you choose starter standard or the premium package thank you very much anyone else want to answer that we do have another question uh, where will the chemistry and physics practice be done i presume this is for um I don't know if this is for High Cambridge school. or was it the CAPS? High Does school. CAPS have, have pracs as well? From grade 10, we'll all have grade from grade 10 to 12 um, when and they can choose their those? subjects. Well, that will be, that we'll be able to answer when, when we start offering grade 10, 11 and 12. But I promise you, we will make sure that we make provision for that. Because we're only offering, just so that everybody knows, we are launching in January, grade one to grade nine. And then we are going to be launching a couple of months later with grade 10 to grade 12. Okay. So for grade yeah. one to grade nine, it's not relevant, the, 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 the uh, practical, where they have to go to do practicals. Okay. All right. Maybe they're asking about Cambridge. Could it be because Cambridge is relevant only for AS levels? I don't know if they're aware that we do the alternative to practicals for Cambridge IG. up until IGCSE. Okay. So I'm not quite sure which curriculum they're referring to there. But anyway. Um, I have a question for uh, Belinda, but I think Brett also wanted to, <laughs> to come in on this. And that's the learning styles question. You know, so the question is, how do you choose a curriculum which would be most suited to your child? Do you use learning styles as a determining factor? You know, that's really the question that's being asked. Is that something that should be in your consideration as a parent? Uh, what are the consequences of enforcing a curriculum on a child if it's not suited to them? Hmm. What are their interests? You know, how, how independent are they as a learner? It goes back to what Brett was saying, you know, to be in an online school, you need a level of support or a level of independence that you are a switched on learner, that you are motivated, that you can organize your materials. If you've got poor executive functions and you're not a, not a very good self-starter, you're going to need support, whether that be from a parent sitting beside you and supporting you or in a tutor center um, or with a tutor at home um, but it's about you know for primary school and I when I speak I speak about primary school I've got sure. no conception of of high school and <laughs> AS levels and goes over my head um, but at primary school you know you, you you want the child to be excited about learning mm -hmm. you want them to have that passion you want them to be excited about jumping on their lessons and engaging with their teacher in their class then you won half the battle um, and at high school level you want them to choose subjects of where they want to go in the future you know and yes a lot of teenagers don't have a clue about what they want to study or what subjects but you know they have an indication that they know their strengths and they know their weaknesses and challenges but it's about what are they passionate about? What, what makes yeah. them excited to get up and go to school when they're a teenager? And, and I think that's important. Um, what curriculum is going to see them, the journey at the end, where they want to go? Like Cecilia always says, do they want to study overseas or do they want to study here? Mm -hmm. um, and at primary school, we're not even looking that far ahead yet. We're, we're looking at making them excited helping them go along that journey that's a little bit easier, getting them to want to learn and be part of a schooling environment, whether it be online or, you know, being in a physical school. But it's, 
you know, I see so many kids that are not happy about going to school when they're little. And, and that's sad. That's, that's not a good place to be. Um, and I think, you know, when you're thinking about what curriculum suits my child when they're six or seven, because it's seven here in New Zealand, they start school when they're five. <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, don't worry about those, those things right now. Get them to be social and happy and have that love of learning that's going to stick with them until they're at grade seven, eight, and start them then talking about where do you want to go from here? Um, so there was a question about the practical. So see, it was about the IG and AS practicals. Okay. So yeah, it wasn't about uh, CAPS. Mm -hmm. And I just answered that IG has no practicals required because we do the alternative to practicals. And AS, they can contact our exam uh, assistant and our support service. Our help desk can advise them on the nearby centers where they can practice their practical skills. Because yes, then it is advisable to go into a lab, right? And practice the skills. Um, yeah, and uh, there was a question here about, do you need a tutor to check if your child is on track for progress? Well, that's very child dependent and family dependent mm -hmm. and on your budget, right? And because age you dependent <laughs> and yes. age dependent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because if the child's in grade one or grade two or grade three, um, somebody's got to check on that child. Mm. Which brings us, I don't know if, uh, if this was in one of our, uh, one of the webinars where one of the parents said to us, but my child is in grade three and they can work on their own. Why is your content directed to the tutor or the parent? Well, because 98% of kids can't work on their own. No. And we, we realized from grade one to grade six, our content is directed at the parent or the tutor mm. because we are spoon feeding them to homeschool and teach their kids the right way like we will tell you things that i don't know like how to draw the letter a correctly and the letter b do you know how many of us do that how to hold your pencil exactly <laughs> things like that and they they are teaching you how to do that and then obviously over and above that that we're mm. adding additional resources and worksheets and interactive activities um so that um the, the learners got additional work in addition to the prescribed textbooks and the prescribed book uh, uh, read, reading books. So another question about the CAPS is the assessment at primary school. So maybe Belinda, you want to answer this. Do they happen online? I think what they're trying to ask is, is it by paper and pen? Is it typed on computer? Are they marked by us? Or, you know, is the parent going to be expected to do the marking? How does that happen? So there's the set assessments that we have to um, provide by CAPS. They will be like the Cambridge um, curriculum and that they're downloaded by paper. The child will then handwrite them um, and then scan them and send them back. We have got Learnosity that we are at, uh, working with at the moment to make a lot of our worksheets um, and extension worksheets uh, that are online that it can be digitalized and then yeah. mark that um and then so there's different packages so there is the package that the parents can buy the assessments and the memos and mark them themselves and then there's another package where the teacher will do the marking where the assignments are uploaded um so we've tried to cover different packages for different people's needs and, and capabilities um, you know, if you, you don't want to sit at, yes, budgets. And if you don't want to sit at home and mark assignments, then that's probably not the best package for you. If you would like a teacher to do it, then take that package. Um, but we've set up the caps in a similar to way to what we've done with the Cambridge, with the Cambridge Learn. So the dashboard will look similar. The assignments will be uh, peppered between the structured term planner. And everything you can see as a parent tells you, okay, I know that in week nine, I've got this assessment due. So, and it preps you. And throughout the lesson, it will say, don't forget to work on your practical assignment. It's due at the end of next week. Um, well, at least I know I've done that in my natural science because I know as a parent, you don't like the Sunday night bombshell. Mom, I've got an assignment due tomorrow. I think that's the worst of every CAPS parent nightmare is that Sunday night I've got to make a guitar lesson. And at least music. we do have a little bit of flexibility. Hey, Belinda. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, goodness, if that project 
they've got about two weeks to play with because the kids have got holidays. So they've got set holidays, which is another thing that's going to distinguish CAPS from, um, from, our, Cambridge, uh, from our Cambridge offering. And so if, if the learners are falling behind, well, then they've got their three weeks of holiday to catch up the work because they've got to make sure we're going to have a deadline um, in December where all the work has to be done by that date so that we can generate their report card and that they can start the next year, um, mm. obviously, with the report card. And so so they can progress because we still have to follow the CAPS uh, requirements for progression and promotion to the next grade. Um, and that was, I think, one of the parents' questions earlier where they said, oh, can we pick and choose what subjects? Well, um, grade from grade one to nine, we have a prescribed subject list that you have to do certain subjects and pass those subjects in order to be progressed to the next grade. Um, so I think that's that's an important thing to bear in mind is, unfortunately, yes, we have to we have to have students doing Afrikaans and uh, the sciences and life orientation because it's compulsory. It's part of the of the CAPS yeah. offering, and if if the learners want to go back into a traditional school, we don't want to offer them a half completed report card. No. And their transition will be more difficult anyway if they've got uh, gaps and they will probably not be allowed into that grade and would have to repeat it because they'd be missing two years of life orientation or Afrikaans. Or... Okay, so we have gone over time. I know we could keep going. We might have to have another one of these events, especially since we did start a bit late. So I'm sorry, we're going to have to end it here, but I'm going to leave the final word to our panellists. Any wise words of wisdom that you'd like to give forth to our parents when considering this curriculum choice or how to combine the two and i'll start with uh, again as we began cecilia i think it's just important to do your research and to reach out to our education consultants as well our education consultants are knowledgeable but uh, and you know have a, a private consultation with them and they can take you through the system they can show you examples of um, um of the actual curriculum as well um, and just give you the pros and cons. There are pros and cons to both. There is there is not one that is the perfect system. So um, I think you just need to make an informed decision based on your child's needs. Thank you very much. Belinda. No, I don't think that's right. I think, you know, at, at a primary school level, um, you know, you have to only have to look at the two curriculums and it's, you know, uh, do I want my child to focus on those core three subjects um, or, or can they handle uh, a multitude of 10 to 15 subjects and um, you know it's that balance and you have to look at the individual child and look at what they can cope with and and what you can cope with with parents at home um, would you rather focus teaching the child the, the three subjects or teaching them a more robust no, it's, it's hard to give one right answer because it's based on families, individual circumstances, and the mm. child. Mm. Very much. Mm. And now a final word, words of wisdom, Brett, from you. <laughs> no, no words of wisdom and not too many words, I hope. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to encourage parents to engage with their, their, their children in terms of the decisions that they make, I'm not suggesting we should allow our children to dictate what we choose, British curriculum, Cambrian Learn, uh, CAPS curriculum, whatever. But I do think if we can bring our children into the conversation, what are the options? What will work? What are you interested in? It opens a door to a form of communication and a process that will stand a family in very good stead down the line. Mm -hmm. And I want to guarantee that, it, you know, if you're using Cambrian Learn as a student, you're going to get to the point where you become a lifelong learner, capable of learning on your own, whether it's CAPS or the British curriculum. I really want to encourage parents, chat to your children, bring them into the process, do this as a family. Absolutely, 100%. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I once again uh, am sorry we ran out of time. I think we never could have uh, addressed all the questions tonight. We might have to do this again, but I've learned a lot and uh, and your expertise shines through and, uh, and also your child-centered approach. And I think that's what people must understand that it's really very case-specific, child-dependent. There is no single answer and you do need personal consulting in making this choice and a lot of research. 
And, uh, you know, there's no single answer for every child. I think that's why we're offering a multiplicity of curriculums. So thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate your time and your generosity. Uh, and we'll see you back for more, I have no doubt. Thank you, audience. Thank you for your participation. We value your questions and your support, and especially your testimonials. Thank you for those of us who've shared uh, success stories. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.